A superhuman is someone who is self-aware and who cultivates their natural self. Each one of us are gifted with our unique observations, inclinations and curiosities in life. The goal of the Superhuman Project is to help professionals become the best version of themselves and realize their full potential, to honor our natural selves. In each episode, I invite professionals at the top of their field and ask them questions about their quest for self-awareness. What makes them successful and how do they stay at the top of their game? Ultimately, it is about living a life we always wanted to live and not letting other people define it for us. Making sure we fulfill the potential that God has given us and we are living our best selves. Let's jump in. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much for giving us time. We welcome you to the Superhuman Podcast. And uh, I don't know how I should introduce you. You, like I was telling you, you are my ideal. And like you shared, you what is it that you don't do? You are an author. You are a writer. You are a speaker. And uh, if I if I read your bio, it's uh, like pages that I can read on. But something that caught my attention from your LinkedIn profile, you have given TEDx talk. You have your own podcast, Finding Brave Podcast. You are a contributor to so many media outlets, Forbes, Thrive Global, Huffington Post. You have been a teacher at New York University and you also have a Amazon career, amazing career project uh, and a certification for people. So, so there are so many things I think the Superhuman Project community can learn from you and we would like to jump right into it. But before I go there, I would let you introduce yourself to our viewers, to our listeners. And also, I want to know when you he heard about the Superhuman Project community, what came to your mind? So let's start with that. Oh, what great questions already. So, uh, you know, you've said a lot about my bio. I mean, I... It's funny, I not to not to brag or anything, but uh, I I was on a list of top ten LinkedIn headlines, which is a crazy kind of list to be on. But um, if you look at that, I think it really says who I am, which is a finding brave expert, and we can talk about that. Um, what my recent research has showed about bravery and power, and we can talk all about that. But finding brave expert and all those other things you mentioned, speaker, coach, trainer. But really, I'm dedicated to, you know, my sweet spot is women, mid to high level professional women. But I work with men too, love men as well. But really, it's about helping us reach our highest potential, that thrilling, joyful potential that makes us feel alive and proud of who we are. And I'll say that I'm passionate about that because for 18 years, I had a corporate career that was the absolute opposite of that. I wasn't proud of myself for a lot of it, particularly the last few few years. And I faced harassment and, and gender bias and toxic colleagues and narcissistic bosses and zero work-life balance and chronic illness. And But worst, worst of all was waking up saying, is this really what I'm going to be doing with my life in the world of work? So that's, mm -hmm. that's it. The focus is on helping people. Uh, build careers that that they feel proud of and they're kind of pinching themselves your, your superhuman project uh, you know in reading your description and I'm just so honored to be even considered under that bailiwick superhuman but um, you told your own story about what you learned and what you've overcome and I think what superhuman means to me wow I'm just kind of brainstorming this in this moment you know, I, I, I will be completely honest. I have a spiritual component as well. And I believe that we all have a higher self. And I do not mean this as a religious thing. It's not religious in my mind. It's spiritual. It's of the soul, of the spirit. But I think my life turned around when, uh, after a brutal layoff after 9-11, you know, can I tell the story, Amul, do you mind? Yeah, yeah. Love, love to hear it. So I was in marketing and publishing, vice president, a lot of money, the whole bit. But uh, I got laid off in a way that was so crushing to me and felt so unfair. And I'm sitting in my therapist's office a week later, right after 9-11 in October, crying. And he said, and I say this story every chance I get because it was the most pivotal conversation I think I've ever had. He said, Kathy, 
I know from where you sit, this is the worst crisis you've ever faced. From where I sit, it's the first moment you can choose who you want to be in the world. Now, who do you want to be? And the, the funny part of the story, Amul, is when you're stuck and miserable, you don't know the answer to that. If you knew the answer to that, you'd be out of your hole. I didn't know, but this is what happened. My mind went blank, and then I blurted out, I want to be you. And we both laughed. And he said, what a great therapist coach. He said, what does that mean to you to be me? Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to help people not hurt people and be hurt. And from that kernel of an idea, he said, I've known you for two years. I think you'd make a great therapist. And there's a marriage and family therapy training program in two universities here in Connecticut, blah, 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 blah. Honest to goodness. I walked out of his office a different person because I felt like I didn't have to continue to be that crushed, thwarted, unhappy, out of control individual. I could take control. I could do it. And actually being laid off, which was so brutal, was of course the blessing of the century because it freed me, it released me from an 18 year life that I was not happy in. So all of that to say superhuman to me means you've tapped into all of who you are as a human, but more. Yeah. That higher self that I'll, that helps you see who you really are in the world, which is so much bigger than what you see. Wow. You know, that's that's really good. This is something which in in way, in a way, we share a same story. Uh, I'm a sales guy and had my own ups and downs, but definitely I'm very much spiritual and I I believe in the dance with the universe, you know, where you take one step and let the universe take the other step and and just play with the universe and let things unfold for you. So I cannot tell you how much I have learned in terms of uh, surrender and uh, letting go and letting God. But I, I want to know more about the spiritual aspect. How, how did the spiritual inclination helped you overcome the moment of rejection or maybe you know where you have these expectations to continue climbing up the ladder but your heart is saying hold on there is something bigger and it's very difficult to have that trust in something which you have not seen so how did you develop that and how did you you know t took that step in in that uncertain direction I love this question. So it's a little bit, you know, people might think it's a little woo woo, a little crazy, but um, what happened was after the layoff, I embarked on, I would call it a wholesale re reinvention, a real transformation. So I took that, I uh, yes, I did enroll in a master's degree program in marriage and family therapy. And that was life changing, you know, um, I would say there was a spiritual component to that because I had, I was a sheltered little girl from upstate New York. Um, I really hadn't seen much at all. And what the therapy, so I started at 40, what that 41, it, it, it cracked open my heart because I was needing to work in my internship with rape, incest, pedophilia, suicidality, drug addiction. My clients were bringing all of this attempted murder, uh, and I remember in the beginning thinking, I can't do this. I can't sit with a pedophile or someone who abuses his daughter. I hate it. And I remember talking to my supervisor and she said, I'm going to give you a tip here. If you want to help people, you cannot sit in judgment of them. You must find something that you can love, that you can connect with. And I resisted it and resisted it, but the more I tried, the more I could do it. And the more, this sounds very woo-woo, but I don't think I've ever said this publicly on a podcast, so here you go. So in three years of doing that work, I, I would have these weird experiences where I would sit and focus only on that individual. Everything was blocked out. And I would begin to feel things, and at some points I would begin to see like a video in my mind 
of something about this person's life. I know this sounds, I don't think I've really ever said this. So I remember I was studying energy healing as well. I just brought it on. What is it? What's spirituality? What's, uh, and I was doing some energy healing training and I had my hands on, we were doing Reiki training, my hands on a fellow student. We were working on each other. And I remember what happened. I have this video in my mind of a young girl with blonde hair braided, and she was looking into a courtyard, a playground, and she was looking through a chain link fence and she was weeping, crying. She was a young girl. And I knew in my heart watching this video that she had been ostracized, something had happened, but I didn't know what, and what is this? What am I thinking? What am I seeing? So at the end, we were supposed to share. And I shared with her, I'm going to tell you this, this is what I see. And she started to cry and she said, that was me at age, I forget, 11 or 12. Her friends turned on her and bullied her. So it, uh, there are more stories of that. I had a cancer patient, you know, therapy patient who um, was unhappy and depressed. And all of a sudden I knew she wanted to live with her grown son. I mean, I began to know things you have no business knowing, you know, yeah. it, they weren't communicated. So I realized, oh, 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 there's a dimension of connection of energy that is so much bigger than what we normally are taught and trained. The other piece that I think helped me spiritually is uh, I had, um, grown up as a Greek Orthodox, uh, trained as a child in the Greek Orthodox faith. And a lot of it just didn't work for me. Even as a young girl, I said, I don't believe what they're saying here. It didn't feel like a loving God would say this. And yet who am I as a little girl to, and my mother didn't dig that, you know, that I was like, mm, I didn't. So I basically chucked out any idea of spirituality. I threw the whole thing out with the bathwater. But as I, you know, went through this transformation, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if I just created a spiritual life that worked for me? What if I read a hundred books? What if I just chose what felt right in my heart? And then I built and built and built a practice that's, that was based on not prescriptions about how you needed to behave, but what it felt in my heart. And so that grew. Uh, and then, I, you know, I really believe that we need to listen to ourselves. I think we have intuition. We have divinely guided intuition. And um, the final chapter so far is um, I, I heard of a woman, woman named Lorna Byrne, who is a spiritual leader in Ireland and an international best-selling The Secret, I yeah, The Secret. No, no, I think that's another burn. Um, okay. No, it's not, that's not Lorna. Um, oh, that's Rhonda Byrne. Lorna Byrne that's, Ducca. Okay. Rhonda Byrne, right. I have thoughts about The Secret, actually. Um, all sorts of thoughts, but anyway. Um, she had an amazing life story and she sees angels. That's mm -hmm. all I can tell you. So I was so fascinated that I reached out and said, I know you don't know me, but may I interview you? And she's really top, top, you know, mm -hmm. millions of books sold. She said, yes, we did one of these. It's got 100,000 views. And I really read all of her books over a Christmas two week period. I read all of her books. And later, long story short, I met her in Ireland and we delivered a spiritual retreat together in Ireland last year. Wow. 20 American women came over and just sitting next to someone who is that connected to um, whatever you want to call it, the other realm, or uh, it was incredibly life-changing. And, you know, she gives very concrete strategies. You know, she believes in guardian angels. Yeah. Whether you do or not, I do believe that there's help out there for us if we quiet our minds, if we connect internally and listen. And, and I think this is what many people don't do. They don't, let's call it intuition so we don't get too woo-woo here. I think that we're getting it every minute of the day. We're getting signs. Don't partner with that person. This feels wrong. Say this, do this. We have intuition, we have guidance, but we don't listen. We don't understand how precious and powerful it is, I think. You know, this, no, this is, this is so, so good. I cannot tell you because the kind of questions I had in mind, they are very different than 
the conversation which is going on and i love it the reason being i think we share some similar stories in the sense that i also did energy healing i went to kripalu and i did a similar class and you won't believe i was doing the same exercise and i could read the other person's background so i i know what you are talking about and i personally believe that spirituality has a role to play in living a fulfilling life and having a successful career so want to jump on to from a spiritual uh, guru hat of yours to uh, the career guru or should i say career goddess uh, so if you could talk about bringing spirituality at work especially okay. for someone who is listening to this maybe his job is impacted by the pandemic and or maybe they are going through the midlife crisis and they are thinking what am i doing with my life or maybe someone who is a graduate or they are studying and they are trying to think where to focus on so what's your advice for them you know looking looking back from a lens of spirituality to decide where to go you know i love it um one of the questions you had given me up front i think relates exactly to this you know or i'm going to shape it this way what what regret do you have or another way to look i don't really believe in reg regrets because every bump every challenge makes us who we are yeah. makes us bigger and better than we would have been even if it's crushing so i don't love the word regret but mm -hmm. if i could have told my younger self one thing one thing it would be this you are gifted you are talented everyone on the planet is but the point is do you see it do you recognize it and will you leverage it yeah we so you know I, i'll take the the flip side of the answer to your question is what i did for 18 years so i want to tell people because i think this is why we stay stuck i came from you know depression era parents you know and i think every generation has a theme and my parents yeah. theme is security putting food on the table, you know, all of that. So I came, I was risk averse. So right out of college, I wanted to take the very first job I got offered, even though I really wanted to be a great editor at a great publishing house. I wanted to help authors birth their ideas. Ha! Huh! I bailed on that in two seconds, took a crappy job in marketing. Anyway, for 18 years, I did what's expected of me. I did the right, and I'm doing that with quotes, the right thing. I got promoted. I took jobs that would advance me, but I moved fo farther and farther away from what who I really am. So the spiritual piece, you know, a lot of people, this is all I do day in and day out. Talk to people who are wanting a change in their career of some sort, but they have no idea, and they fantasize about starting a bed and breakfast or being a singer. And I am a singer on the side, just so you know. I believe in creative talents and arts. But what we have to do is, first of all, understand who we always have been. So if I look back at who I was as a child, uh, I mean, 16, people would come to me and ask me questions. You know, I'm having a problem with my mother. I Why does this girl not like me? And I'd say to my mom, why are they asking me? I'm 16. What do I know? But I had a therapeutic lens then, right? I love to take chaos and make sense of it. I love to help people. I love to write. I was a singer on stage. I loved, I was a competitive tennis player. All of those things are gifts and talents. But the minute I went to look for a job, I bailed on every one of them. Bailed. That's mistake number one. And that's what I see so many career people doing. They follow a path that either their parents or someone says is going to be good. You're going to get paid. Don't do anything stupid. I have so many, you know, clients who they wanted to be a lawyer. They wanted to be this. They wanted to be that. And their parents, you know, God bless them. They, nobody's trying to blow it. But they were like, don't be ridiculous. You're not going to do that. So the first thing is you can see clues of who you really are by your natural talents that were always there. But the other piece about spirituality is, I'll say this, um, th there's a very, I'm not, I can't, I can't use his name. There's a fa very famous billionaire entrepreneur who says following your passion is ridiculous. You're never going to get rich 
following your passion. So what you should do is do what you're good at. I so don't agree with that, especially for women who are perfectionistic over functioners, the way we're trained culturally. And we're trained to put other people ahead of us. We're trained to do good, but doing good at something or being good at a skill it does not mean you love using that skill. So if you ask me, spirituality is involved by who do I want to help in the world? What are my natural gifts that can be of service? And how do I want to leverage that to make money? And that's also very different from, you know, for instance, I'm a singer. I never wanted to make money singing. I enjoy singing for singing's sake. We also have to separate those impulses that we need in our life, those creative endeavors. But that doesn't necessarily mean you want to make your living at it. You have to try on these directions. You have to vet it. So to that entrepreneur millionaire who says, don't follow your passion, it's going to make you broke. I say, bull. And I say this, if you follow it, if you pursue your passion in a wise way, where you're trying on directions first before you're risking all your money, when you're vetting out a professional uh, direction first, and then you try it on and then you take small measured steps to move forward on that path, it can be incredibly successful. Where you go broke is when you just throw all your eggs in one basket that's been unvetted and you end up, you're not capable of it, you're not suited to it. So I feel like spirituality informs all of this. What does your heart want? But you have to be wise. Use your guidance. Use Get help to vet it out um, in a wise, smart, measured way. But the other piece is I really believe everyone has a purpose on this planet. Now, not all of us are Gandhi or Mother Teresa. Sometimes our, our sphere of influence is small. Sometimes our purpose is very narrow but I believe we all have one. So when people come to me, they say, what is my purpose? Or I can't find my calling. And the tip there is you're looking too big. What I want you to do is break it down to the smallest thing. What do you long to do? And how do we get you doing that today? No matter what job you're in, how do we start you to do that and live that purpose today? If you want to write, start writing. If you want a podcast, look into, you know, I can just go on and on and not let you have a no, word. This is very helpful. Here. No, 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 no. This is very helpful because this is exactly what I would wanted to hear from someone like you, an expert like you. Now, my belief is listening to the heart. And honestly, I feel that we have same stories. I am a trained singer too, by the way. But that's what? a separate subject. What? Uh, yeah. Amazing. So, uh, but I think that listening to heart also, more than that, I come from the same era, like you mentioned. It's more about securing a good career, having a good financial backup before deciding what else you could do. So, and when you are always trying to go back to your heart, what, what I have seen that stops us is the society or our peers or friends when we go out and start comparing ourselves to others. Why cannot I be like this or that? So how do you, what's your advice there? Because I know a lot of people are probably not that sad because of stuck being stuck in a wrong job. Maybe they are more sad by looking at others and comparing their themselves or their lives with others. So what's your advice for them in terms of for, for getting to, to look at the world and looking inside? What, what's your advice there? That's a fantastic question. So I think that, and you know, my, my world, I, I study a lot about gender and how men and women are different and we are, and we're shaped differently by culture. And society and and a lot of men feel intense pressure to uh, make a lot of money, be successful, climb the ladder. Yeah. You know, here's what I see. I'll be honest with you. You know, every once in a while, I'll have a client uh, or a new client come or vet me as a coach, and they'll say, "Here's what I want. I want to be a vice president in three years, and I want to make a hundred thousand more." And I'll say, "I'm not going to take you on with that goal. 
And they're like, what? What kind of career coach are you? That's not the goal you want. The goal you want generally is to be recognized. You want more juicy responsibility that makes you feel good about yeah. what you're doing and the impact. You don't want that. But we are trained by, as you say, this intense comparison with others, what we should be going for. I mean, I'll even have people say, I'm a coach and you know, I look at you and I think I should have two books out and a course and they don't want to do that. So, I mean, I would ask you to, to take, I have something called a career path assessment. It's 11 pages of questions I wish someone had asked me 30 years ago. And if I had answered them honestly, I wouldn't have made the mistakes I made. I can link to that and we'll, and people can, it's free. Um, I'd ask you to sit down this weekend and have an intensive review of who you are. And, you know, it, it looks, it asks you to look at every job you've ever had, what you loved, what you hated, what you never want to do again, and what you want to bring forward. What are your standards of integrity? What are your true values? But so many people have told me, I got on some treadmill, some, some rabbit, you know, what do you call it? Hamster wheel that I need to make money. And I was on that wheel. Um, and part of that is you've lost an ability to feel self-esteem except for the money in your bank account and accept your title. So I would ask people to, so I've had clients who've said, I make a lot of money and I'm so miserable. What I really want is to live in a cabin in the, in the woods. I want to work only half the year. You know, that's, that's exactly what I have seen when I go out and talk to people and especially now during the pandemic, I have seen a lot of people, the pandemic has given them a chance to stop comparing themselves and get out of that race and start thinking what they always wanted to do. Yeah, that's true. That's this, uh, you know, things have silver linings. I've heard from so many people who say, now that I'm in the middle of this and it's changed everything for me, I've had it. I've had it with a career I don't like. I've had it with a toxic boss. I'm done with it. Uh, and I think, you know, we're seeing people die, people that we love. We're seeing the fragility of human life. And whenever that happens, it happened after 9-11 too. You wake up and say, you know what? I'm not going to waste this life I have. I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to take action. So that's a silver lining. I think of the pandemic, you know, one of them. Yeah. You know, my spiritual guru, I, I'm very spiritual and my spiritual guru, uh, you must have heard him, Dr. Wayne Dyer. Oh yeah. You know, he, of course. he used to say, let go and let God. And I have realized, you know, there is a point in time in all of, all of our lives. Uh, and this is what Dr. Wayne Dyer used to say that, Sometimes for some people, it comes probably very early in their life. Maybe they are when they are babies. For people, it comes probably at the deathbed where they question the meaning of life. Yeah. Uh, and usually it comes at a point in, a, in your career as well where things are not working. You know, like, like in my case, I'm, I'm a sales guy. I'm an engineer. I always think like the more you put in, in terms of hard work, the more better output you get. But when I realized at a point in time when I was using the same formula, but the things were not up to my expectations, that's when I went back to spirituality to look at my answers, why things are not working. Wow. Wonderful. I know you had something more to add about spirituality at work. I did. Um, you know, lately I've been interviewing a lot of amazing uh, men as well as women, but I'm going to focus on the men for a minute, talking about powerful leadership and how we can build a connection culture and how we need to reinvent masculinity. And so I want to say one quick thing. You know, we live in a patriarchal world, let's face it. And in a patriarchal world, we split ourselves in half. We know what the masculine is supposed to be, and we know what the feminine is supposed to be. Masculine is tough, not vulnerable, not emotional, right? Gets it done, uh, decisive. Feminine is soft, malleable, pleasing, puts people first, uh, accommodating. The problem with these gender roles is it stifles us all. What we need is wholeness. So I've interviewed some people on reinventing masculinity. And just yesterday, I was doing my podcast um, recording with Michael Stollard, who's been a wonderful mentor of mine. 
And he's written extensively and trains leaders on building a connection culture. And he was talking about he was in the presence of a, a very senior admiral, admiral in, I can't say that word, admiral in the Navy. Tough guy, incredible. And everyone loved this man. And he was standing up in front of, uh, you know, tons of Navy folks. And what he was saying is this, you have to love the people that report to you. Love. And I said to my friend, Mike, I want to ask a question. If I'm standing up in front of a thousand women and say, you must learn, you must learn how to experience love for the people that work for you and who you work with, they're all going to nod their heads pretty much. And I don't mean to paint every woman with the same brush or every man, but in general, women are going to nod. In general, I don't think men are going to nod. And I was even telling my son that he's like, mom, you're really painting a picture of all men. You shouldn't do that. But I asked my friend, Mike, I said, what do you think? Because he works with senior men, many of them. He said, I think you're right. And I think that men will squirm when they hear that. Now, does that mean there isn't love in their heart? No, it means how we are trained to be. And it trains us away from that because I think I'm going a step further. Love requires vulnerability. Love requires realness. Love requires authenticity and transparency. And I remember teaching at that one NYU course, there were men and women, and I said, people want to bring their whole selves to work. And one fellow said, no way. I said, you don't want to bring your whole self to work? He said, I do not. And I said, tell me more. And he said, I don't want people knowing my real life. I don't want to wear my heart on my sleeve. He had a whole idea of what bringing your whole self means. I don't want it. I have to compartmentalize. And he went off and he asked about five of his male friends. And the next week in the class, he goes, I asked every, every guy I knew. And they said, nope, don't want the whole self. This is how we're trained culturally and societally. My whole point is, I don't think I felt a lot of love in my 18 year corporate career. But every day in the work that I do now, there's, there's love. I love my clients. I love my podcast guests. I love my Forbes interviewees. It's the feeling of true, truly abundant love. And I feel that's a spiritual thing. No, yeah. And I think what you mean more is to be my true self, you know, where I can be my true self along with my good side and my not so good side yeah. where I can, like you mentioned, vulnerable. I remember the, the days when you, we all feared being judged at work. You know, we, we were like, even at school growing up, my parents would say, don't talk about things which are not related to school with your teachers. So they never wanted to Why? anyone to, to judge, you know, and that, that the same psyche we carry at the workplace That's because right. we want to keep the, the work separate from, personal oh, lives and right. definitely after the this work from anywhere the pandemic i think there is no separation right. and we have to be we have to bring the the personal self and the professional self both together at the workplace and i i, I don't think there is any room for judgment if we want to be productive and effective at work I love what you're saying. And I say it all the time. You're a person when you show up to your professional life. If you think you can separate it, you're kidding yourself. Everything you've ever learned, every that child that you were, all the pain. You know, my, my second book is about the seven damaging power gaps that keep professionals from thriving. A lot of it you learned in your childhood. A lot of it you was a trauma that you faced. Was your mother or father, one of them was manipulative, maybe, your parents told you, don't, shh, don't talk about that. Don't do that. My, I remember my mother who's 96 and overcame COVID. I adore my mother. I, she told me I was a great tennis player. I was number one on the tennis team, went to the States. Boys would call me up, all sorts of boys. I want to play you. And they would be like, let me brag that I could whip the number one girl. I'd always mm -hmm. wipe the court with them. And my mother would say, don't beat the boys. Don't, don't, mm. mom. Why not? Because they won't like you. Hmm. So all of these messages get in. And I'm saying we got to look at those messages that keep us from being our whole fullest self. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean we're running around the workplace, you know, gabbing about our intense, personal, intimate lives. No. Yeah. I'm saying be who you really are. Yes. If that's loving. If that's creative, if, if that's outspoken, my my friend William Aruda, who's a wonderful um, personal brand. I know him. Yeah, you know William. He says, "Work your quirk, work your quirks." God, I love it. But if you're hiding your quirks because you're afraid of being judged, you're gonna have an unhappy life. So you know, I must have to admit that you are, and I'm very excited to say that you are the first guest. I'm keeping track of time. That I have to. I want to continue talking, uh, but. But I, we would have to set up separate time to continue this. But I want to definitely record this because probably I have not even co covered ten percent of what I wanted to. Oh, that's to so add kind. <laughs> that's so kind. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We will continue our conversation with Kathy Caprino in part two of the interview episode to be published later. If you would like to listen this full episode, you can go to our YouTube channel or Apple iTunes or Spotify. Go there and search for The Superhuman Project and you will find us. In case you would like to contact us, please follow our LinkedIn page and send us a direct message. Until then, thank you.